Chen and Bloom is, my mind is a blank <laughs> instantly. Um, I'm a writer and I've written two books. I only know how to pronounce them in my own language and they have different titles, but one is called Those Who Save Us, which is a World War II novel about a German woman who gets involved with an SS officer to protect herself and her little daughter when she's caught in the act of the resistance and the daughter's quest 50 years later to find out what the mother did because the mother will never talk about it. Um, in, in Dutch, I believe it's pronounced something like Het Family Portrait, right? Um, and the second novel, which in English is called The Storm Chasers, and I am not even going to try and pronounce it in, in Dutch, um, but I'm told it's meant something like um, to be in between things, a struggle between, or a dilemma, which I think sums up the book perfectly. Um, that is about a pair of boy-girl twins. The boy has bipolar disorder and the girl does not. And um, the boy, Charles, likes to chase tornadoes when he's manic, something you can only do in the US. Um, and his sister, Karina, tries to chase him and keep him safe and keep him from doing more damage to himself um, and to other people. I don't believe I ever really decided to become a writer. I think it was decided for me. I have never been good at doing anything else besides writing, talking about writing, teaching writing, and food service. <laughs> and for many years I was a waitress to support myself um, while I was trying to make a living as a writer. Uh, my dad was a writer. He was a broadcast journalist and so my earliest memories are punctuated by the sound of his typewriter. And as early as four, I began writing my own stories. And all I've ever wanted to do was write stories and write books. And I'm very lucky that I now have a life that enables me to do that and to go about talking about them as well. It is not an instant gratification profession, writing. It took me 33 years to publish my first book and another five years to publish the second book. And somebody asked me earlier today, what took you so long? If you decided you wanted to be a writer when you were about four, and you know what were you doing in the intervening 29 years? And the answer is that I was writing short stories, having some of them published. I published a short story when I was 16 years old in Seventeen Magazine, which is a big deal in the States. Um, a, I won a national fiction contest for that short story, and so I decided subsequently that the world owed me a living as a writer, which I then discovered meant that the world owed me a living as a waitress. Um, and I kept sending out short stories in college, after college, getting some of them published, getting multitudes more rejected. Every time I got one rejected, I would send out 10 more and pollinate the world with fiction. Um, and I was cutting my teeth on drafts of novels all the way along too. Those Who Save Us, I remember saying about to my mom, this is the best I can do, and if this one doesn't hit, then I'm gonna move to Nebraska and be a truck stop waitress. And of course I would have kept writing, but I was just very lucky, very grateful that that novel did find success with its readers, and the readers were the ones who made that novel successful. The process of researching Those Who Save Us consisted of going to Germany four times with my mom. So that was arguably scarier than researching my second book, which I did by Chasing Tornadoes. Um, my mom took me to Germany for the first time in 1993. She is part German and she wanted to see where her side of the family had come from. So we visited the town, which was a little farm town called Wallhausen in East Germany. And then we spent a month driving around the country, not speaking German, not even really driving very well, but just trying to understand how could this country that had produced so many great composers, musicians, and artists and writers, my mom is a concert pianist, um, had also engineered history's most atrocious mass genocide. And it was during that time that Those Who Save Us was born, we had just come down from Buchenwald concentration camp and we're driving toward the nearby city of Weimar. And I asked my mom, instead of how could this have happened here, what would you have done if you had been living in Weimar during the war? 
Um, my dad is Jewish, and so I would have been sent with my dad to the camps, but my mom would have been considered a full-blooded Aryan. And she said, I don't know what I would have done. I like to think I would have helped my Jewish friends and neighbors by hiding them, by feeding them, by getting them out of the country. But if the Nazis caught you, they would kill you. It wasn't a game. They would kill your children. And if I had you kids to care for, I don't know if I would have been brave enough. I can only hope. And that was the, really the genesis for those who save us, um, which I think as of as being about an ordinary German woman who's caught in this crucible of circumstance and forced to make the choiceless choice. I never really did reach a conclusion about how human beings could perpetrate such atrocity on each other, and I spent a subsequent decade between that trip to Germany and the book's publication, reading everything I could again about the time period, watching German movies, trying to learn German, at which I was a failure, and conducting the interviews. And there are all sorts of demographic, economic, historic explanations for why the Holocaust happened, but in terms of emotion, I still um, never found a reasonable answer. And what really struck me about the interviews and I think informed the novel more than anything was what one Polish survivor told me. The Nazis had liquidated her village, set it on fire, she swam across the river Bug to safety in the forest and she didn't know how to swim. And she said to me, you never know what you are going to do until your back is up against the wall. And I thought about that both from the survivor perspective and from the perpetrator perspective, that on any given day, you might be able to swim that river or you might not. You might be handed a gun and shoot somebody or you might not. And what I hope is that the book, instead of posing an answer, poses a question, what would you do, quite honestly, as a frail, um, fallible human being? Well, I have bipolar disorder in my family, or as it has been commonly called, manic depression. Um, I'm not bipolar. I have a great therapist, and I ask her a lot, am I bipolar? And she says, you're not. And I say, am I a little bit bipolar? And she says, you're not. You're just a writer. Um, but the reason I ask is that the disorder is inherited and genetic, and often people who have manic depression in their families but don't have it themselves feel terribly guilty. And what I really wanted to explore in, in The Storm Chasers was um, what it's like to watch somebody you love go through these terrible extremes of mood, from manias which are very seductive to the person who's having them, to depressions that are debilitating and often make people suicidal. Um, they're not easy to medicate. There is no easy answer, again, to this question of, you know, how far would you go to protect somebody? How do you protect somebody? And so I'm hoping that this book, too, poses the question, how far do you go to protect somebody you love? What risks do you take with your own safety? So it seemed like a natural fit to me to combine um, Charles, this character who is manic depressive, with storms that seem to come out of nowhere, devastate the landscape, disappear again, and you never know when they're going to come back because that's exactly like Charles's moods. So the mental atmosphere in the book reflects the emotional atmosphere of the characters. I researched the storm chasers by Unfortunately, again, direct observation of people in my family who are very ill with bipolar disorder. And then anything that I don't understand, my dad always said, Jen, go to the library and look it up. So I did my due diligence doing a decade's worth of reading about the disorder. Um, but for the storm chasing component of the book, I have been chasing tornadoes myself <laughs> with a professional storm chase company in Texas called Tempest Tours, which is the basis for whirlwind tours in the novel. And I did what Karina, the heroine of the novel, does when she's searching for her brother who's a storm chaser. I followed this professional storm company in my own vehicle in exchange for writing about them. Um, and so for the last five summers, I have been driving around the Great Plains toward weather that everybody else is driving away from. Uh, it has been often a terrifying experience, as it should be, because you are driving toward things that can kill you, and if you're not scared 
then you should be scared because you're not being respectful. But it has also been exhilarating to be introduced to the interior of my own country, um, which is very grand and majestic, unpopulated and lonesome. Most Americans don't even get to see their own country. Um, and also to be introduced to the great grand science behind um, storms. And that is a learning curve for me that I'm continuing to climb. The two books which readers often write to me and say, I don't understand how you could write such different novels. Are you, are the books themselves bipolar? I think actually they're very similar in theme. They're both about how far you would go to protect somebody you love. Those Who Save Us is about a mother's love for her daughter. Um, the Storm Chasers is about a sister's love for her brother. They both have these weighty moral conundra or the dilemmas, the in-between things at their centers. And they are both about people who survive terrible trauma that's visited on them by giant outside forces, whether World War II, the Nazi juggernaut, um, severe weather, mental instability. These traumas force secrets and terrible burdens on my characters and the books explore what it's like to go through life with um, post-traumatic stress, with the burden of a secret, and how you might still reach out to others and try your, to build your life in the aftermath of such events. Both of my books are about dilemmas in that, again, they pose questions as opposed to trying to give easy answers. And what I really want is for the reader to put him or herself in the shoes of the characters and say, what would I do in that situation? What would I do if I were asked to save somebody I barely know at the possible expense of my own life? What would I do if somebody I love more than anything needed my help, but in order to help him, I had to pose a danger to myself. Um, and I really think that a lot of the time writing books is not about giving the right answers, but hopefully about asking the right questions. Writing means everything to me. I would be lost without writing because ever since I was a child, story is the way in which I frame the world and make sense of the world. That if I look at a series of events, I will automatically start trying to mentally shape it into a narrative. And it's the way I think most writers, including me, impose meaning on otherwise random events. So writing is um, magic to me. It often feels like a form of inspiration that comes from somewhere up here, you know, through me to the paper, hopefully then to reach a reader. It's um, an organizing principle. It's what I love to do more than anything in the whole world. And luckily for me now, it is the way I make a living in the world too. Um, and that is a great merciful boon. Writing is about understanding the world um, from my perspective and in terms of giving writing to my readers. I hope to give to my readers what I get out of books, which is a way to understand the world and a way to feel less alone. I think good fiction um, reflects real things through that fictional lens, through the lens of make-believe. But even if it's something as small as the description of light shimmering on a wall, or um, maybe it's about uh, dealing with somebody who's frightening because he's mentally ill, if I can provide accurate descriptions of those things and one reader writes to me to say, oh, the, I totally know what you meant by this, but I was never able to put it into words before, thank you, then I feel that I've reached a hand across the void that exists between all people um, and may that void not exist for a moment. And so I think that writing for me and reading for me is about feeling less alone and I hope that's what I give to my readers as well. I have two writers who are very important to me that you may think are on opposite ends of the spectrum. One is Stephen King, whom I read voraciously growing up, and I really like old Stephen King novels, the original novels like The Stand or The Shining or The Dead Zone, not because of the paranormal events, which I find the least interesting facet of his work, but because he knows how to tell a good story to keep the action moving and keep the reader interested, and because his grasp of psychology is very keen and he does great portraiture of 
people under duress. And so I like to think that my work shares that, except that instead of my characters being menaced by giant spiders or haunted hotels, they're menaced by their own minds or by outside circumstance. And the other writer whom I aspire to be is William Styron, um, who wrote Sophie's Choice and The Confessions of Matt Turner and um, a couple of other really, really good books. Styron is not as prolific as Mr. King, but I think what I admire so much about his work is that all of his books are weighted with a moral center, which is important to me. They are about something. And what Styron aspired to do was to marry that moral center with beautiful writing. And so if I can achieve both of those things in my books, then I will have done what I set out to do.